So, you guys ever make mistakes? Yeah, me either. I'll show you how I fix that later, but first, I'm gonna grapple with this 144 pound walnut slab, try to avoid a hernia. First I squared off the ends and then debarked it, and then, secretly, off camera, in a thunderstorm, I milled all this walnut for the table legs and the base. And then I started chopping it all up into smaller pieces. Now I wanted to focus on the glue ups of the legs first. Oh yeah, that's fresh. Now with these glue ups, I'll be able to get two leg blanks and a nice little pile of sawdust. My pal Jerry helping with the declamping process. And then a little surface prep after the glue is cured. Make sure everything is milled flat. Then I can lay out the legs with my template. Now these legs have a double taper, which can confuse things if you don't keep track of a square reference face. Now since these walnut monoliths are almost four inches thick, I had to make two passes with the track saw, one on each side to split it down the middle. Then I can head over to the miter saw and make a two and a half degree cut on the bottom. Then using my template as a guide, I make a score cut at the final length of 28 and a half inches and then cut it at a two and a half degree miter. Then I could repeat the process on the other legs, giving me four identical blanks. Ooh, that's nice. Now, instead of fiddling with alignment and dealing with slippage, I tacked on a couple of stop blocks to allow me to mark all my legs exactly the same. I learned this back in my carpentry days when I used to lay out rafters for a roof. Then I could head to the joiner and pass by pass, remove enough material until I just kissed my layout line. And that gave me four nice looking blanks and a couple of spares. Now I mentioned before these legs get a double taper, but before I could make the taper on the inside of the leg, I needed to make the T bridle joints on the legs and the top stretcher. This was a three and a half inch deep cut, so a dado stack wouldn't work here. So I established my outside cuts, chewed away the waist, and then cleaned up the bottom with a chisel. Now I could use my dado stack to make a test cut for the stretcher. That fits pretty snug. Then I could cut the grooves in both stretchers. I used a stop block to get consistent results on all of my pieces. That will do nicely. I also nipped off the bottom corner just to add a little detail to each of the stretchers. And here are all the parts laid out and ready for final tuning. <laughs> The router plane makes quick work of cleaning up all the faces to a consistent depth. Then back to my setup on the table saw to cut a notch that will cover the bottom edge of the grooves that we cut in the legs. And alas, I can lay out my inner taper. I came down four inches from the top where the leg will taper down to two and a quarter. I use the same process on the joiner as I did with the first taper, but I will spare you that footage. Now with everything cut, I could do a quick dry assembly. Ooh, that is pleasant. Using the smallest pencil I could find, I lay out for another stretcher roughly two thirds of the way up from the bottom. This will add a little more strength as well as a nice aesthetic detail. I marked it in place, set my miter saw to the correct angle, and then using a one, two, three block, I offset it one inch from the outside of the leg. Now I could lay out for my dominoes, and then domino it. Now dowels would be a perfectly acceptable alternative here, or obviously a true mortise and tenon. Now since the domino fence only allows you to offset your dominoes so much, I had to use an auxiliary fence to cut the second row of dominoes. Now I couldn't just flip the leg over and use the other face as a reference because it had a taper on it. Now that is snugly. And while I do a little bit of sanding here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell to keep up with all the projects I have coming up. Your support is greatly appreciated. And now for the glue up. I used Tight Bond 3 on the Domino stretchers, but turned to Gorilla Polyurethane glue for the bridle joints. PVA glue will swell the wood fibers and I didn't want to run into any resistance when clamping these assemblies together. The extra open time with the polyurethane glue is great, but it also expands two to three times its normal size and starts to foam up at the mouth, so you gotta be careful. Now with the glue dried, it was time for cleanup. A card scraper and a chisel to the rescue. Get that little foam squeeze up I mentioned. The card scraper is magnificent for this. Gets in those little corners and then a little hand sanding. 
Then I could kind of do a little bit of a dry assembly and see how this thing is going to look on that walnut slab. I'm digging it. Next up was to rip down some stock for the side aprons and the inner stretchers all to three and a half inches wide. With those rough cut, I could lay out my mortises for the aprons on the legs and use more green tape. Now the side aprons will meet here with a fully integrated tenon. I used the drill press to clean out the majority of the waste in the mortise. Now this could also be done with a router, but I didn't feel like making a jig to plunge the correct angle into the legs, so this was just easier. I used a paring block and a chisel to square up the walls. And then I could square up those end corners. To make the tenons, I used the same process I used to make the T-bridle joint, but set my miter gauge to five degrees to match the taper on the legs. Then I could swing my miter gauge five degrees the other way to get the other side. And then flip it up on edge to establish a new shoulder for the top and bottom of the tenon. Then I clean up that little five degree wedgie that I left behind. I chamfer the edges of the tenon to make it a little bit easier to slide into the mortise. More router plane noises for your enjoyment. And the dry fit equals... Giddy up. Next I ripped up some stock for the angled support stretchers. Now trying to get these angles correct was a raging banshee. So I used a scrap piece and just kept nipping away at the miter saw and inching up on the right angle until I nailed it. Ah, 19 and a half degrees there and the inner one was 17. Now I'm sure there was some kind of geometric formula to figure it out, but my brain wasn't prepared. Now obviously I love the domino. I use it on every project, but this one required extremely careful layout to get these to line up right. And thankfully my patience paid off this time. So the bottom stretcher assembly is basically a ladder formation. So I made this little jig to give me perfectly spaced dominoes in the correct position all the way down the line. Well, at least I thought I did. Please stand by because that thought will be disavowed very shortly. Now I wanted to glue up this subassembly first and then glue it to the leg assemblies. But I ran into a bit of a snag, as I mentioned. Oh yeah. Major burn. After a full investigation, I'm still not sure what I did, so I buried that memory deep in my soul and fixed it. I flush cut those dominoes, then basically had to recut my mortises about a quarter of an inch down. Not a big deal, just another wrench in the spokes to slow me down. And with all things repaired, except for my pride, I could proceed with the rest of the glue up. Get in there, you little bugger. After the glue was set, I could move on to the angled stretchers and bring the entire base together for the first time. For this, I used epoxy, which gave me the luxury of much more open time as well as nice slippery joints. And it doesn't foam up like the polyurethane glue. And I actually didn't even have clamps long enough for this assembly, so I had to buy those clamp extenders for my parallel clamps. Now I did a dry fit of all the sub-assemblies separately, but never the whole assembly together as one. So this is the first time it's all coming together. So it was a little nerve wracking, but luckily everything came together. Whew, let's subscribe and celebrate. The next day when the epoxy was cured and all the clamps had magically disappeared, I was assigned to cleanup duty. Now with a freshly sharpened card scraper, I went to work on cleaning all the squeeze out. Wicked fun. Now I did get a tip on Instagram from someone who said if I apply some shellac ahead of time on these areas, that that epoxy will kind of wipe right off with some, I believe, mineral spirits, because that will dissolve the shellac. So I'm going to try that at some point. A quick wipe down with some solvent just to give a sneak preview, and that grain is popping. To attach the table top to the base, I like to make custom buttons rather than using Z clips or figure eights. It's definitely a lot more work, but I think it just adds that custom touch to a piece of furniture. I used a 1 quarter inch and a 3 eighths inch router bit to create a stepped slot in all the pieces. 
Then I could rip it down to width on the table saw. Then with my dado stack, I could mass produce all the rabbits in each of the buttons. Rip them down to width. And then slice them into individual pieces on the miter saw. Round off those corners a little bit on the spindle sander. Voila! And I use the domino again to actually cut the enlarged slots for the buttons to slide into. They all needed a little shaving just for a nice tight fit. Yep. Now since this table will live at a seasonal shore house near the ocean, I decided to install steel C-channel underneath to keep it flat. To do this, I used a 1 quarter inch spiral upcut bit, which cut a groove to accept the flanges of the steel, and then a mega dado bit to cut a recess that will allow the entire piece of steel to sit flush with the surface. Along with elongated slots in the steel, you want to leave about 3 eighths to a half an inch on each end of the steel to allow for even more expansion and contraction. I use a little CA glue just to permanently seat those threaded inserts. Put the C-channel in and attach it with bolts. And now it was finish time. Again for this project I use Rubio Monaco Pure, which just pairs so well with walnut. I will do two coats sanding with 400 in between. Now the second coat doesn't add any more protection, but it does bring the sheen up a little bit, which I like. So I had a little dent on the top. Uh, so before I could put the finish on, I used this little trick, which is take an iron and a wet rag, and it will raise those wood fibers up. You may have to do this a couple times if it's a really deep dent. Now you have to wait till it is fully dry before you sand, otherwise those wood fibers could contract again. And there you can see the difference. Perfect. I already put a coat of Rubio on the bottom, and now I could do it on the top. I use a white scotch bright to work it in, and then a clean rag to wipe off the excess. Before I could do the second coat, I wanted to inlay my medallion on the side apron. So to do this, I used a little template and a straight bit. And I could pop my little logo medallion in with a little CA glue and then also a little wood glue. Last step was to install the C-channel. What you want to do here is tighten this all the way down and then back off about an eighth of a turn. And there you have it, C-channel installed, looking good. There's Lola doing her final inspection checks. And here are the buttons getting installed. And a final look at the base and the top together, upside down. And here are some final glamour shots. Wow, check out that grain. I love that transition from the sapwood into the heartwood. Thanks so much for following along with this build, and don't forget if you want to keep up with all my future projects, please hit that subscribe button below and the notification bell, and we'll see you on the next one.